Hello, welcome to Outside Xbox, you're watching Show of the Week, I'm Mike. And I'm Andy. This week I've been playing the big new console exclusive that everyone's talking about. Okay. It's epic in scale. Uh-huh. Set in exotic locations. Right. It's mostly about dragons. Oh, I thought you were going a totally different way with that. Yeah, I can't, can I? We're an Xbox channel. What, still? Epic in scale, though. You get it? Right, with you. Because dragons have big scales. Yeah, thanks. Is there anything actually useful you can tell me about it? Wonderful. Well, yes, the first thing you need to know is that Scalebound is being made by Japanese action specialist Platinum Games and headed up by legendary game director Hideki Kamiya, a man known for creating Devil May Cry and Bayonetta and crushing insolent fools on Twitter. Hardly seems like a fair fight. Scalebound, due next year, has you playing as all-American Team Drew, who gets transported, Captain N style, into a fantasy world called Draconis. There, he ends up bonded to a dragon, getting a new fire-breathing friend called Tuban, and a spectacular new skin disorder. <laughs> At least get a manicure, mate. Those nails are out of control. We caught up with Kamiya-san and his multitasking creative producer slash translator JP Kellums at E3 and perhaps it's best to let the man himself explain the relationship between Drew and his dragon. Drew is obviously a guy from our world and he's been thrust into that fantasy world and now he's been bonded with this dragon. How are you going to get along with this dragon? How are you going to work with this dragon? How are you going to overcome the obstacles in the world together with a dragon? It's going to be a process of learning for the player and it's also going to be a learning process for Drew, and by linking those two together, we think that users are going to find, or gamers are going to find, you know, a really strong narrative and emotional resonance with Tuban. And by a process of learning, he means that initially Tuban can be a big scaly jerk. Clearly, your dragon doesn't yet realize quite how many handbags you could make out of him. A little warning next time. But Tuban will be your big scaly jerk. Scalebound includes co-op for up to four players, and each player will have their own customized dragon, tailored both to their own playstyle and aesthetic tastes. So this, the customization is really important to us because we want users to be super invested in their dragons. We'd already shown the kind of the Rex type dragon, the all-rounder that you know, we first showed a couple years ago. And at Gamescom last year, we showed the tank type dragon, the four-legged dragon who's kind of strong and powerful. And yesterday we showed the Wyvern for the first time. And the Wyvern's light, fast, flies really well, can do that cool drill attack. And they all had different skins, so the kind of the visual look of the dragons and just different. And what we really want is for gamers to kind of invest in their dragon, customize their dragon, then go online and when they're playing co-op, show off their dragon. We're looking forward to some of the literal monstrosities that people will come up with. One of our other favorite elements of the game is that Drew pops his headphones on to listen to thumping dance tunes that get him pumped for big battles like this horrifying spidery crab scorpion thing. Oh, crap! Though, as Kamiya-san points out, burying himself in his beats is more of a psychological boost than a physical one. So it's not a pure gameplay mechanic, it doesn't change how the game is played, but obviously as gamers, when that music shifts and like it's time to put a final end to a boss, you get amped up, and we really want to tie into that. But the headphones aren't actually a way of making Drew more powerful, they're a way of actually expressing his weakness. By putting his headphones on and listening to the music that he likes, he kind of goes into his own world and can kind of amp himself up to try to, you know, tackle these crazy things that are happening to him that he can't control. So instead of just being something where, yeah, Drew's cool, he's a bro, he's going to put on music and go kill things, it's actually kind of expression of the weakness behind that. And we really wanted to use it as a way of talking about who Drew is without using words. Well, in that case, I hope he bought a portable battery pack to keep his MP3 player topped up, because I can't see there being many USB ports going spare in the verdant hills of Draconis. And Draconis does look spectacular. It's a huge open fantasy world with crisp blue skies, dramatic scenery, and plenty of space to soar around on the back of your dragon buddy. If it weren't for the infestation of giant insects, it would get a full five stars on TripAdvisor. But that giant spider boss is pretty creepy, and of course, with Kamiya having famously acted as director on Resident Evil 2 and Devil May Cry, is there a darker side to scale story. Yeah. Do you remember I made Okami? Man, owned by Hideki Kamiya and not even just on Twitter. Is that something I can put on my resume? 
So, how do you kill the dragon? You don't kill the dragon, the dragon's your friend. <laughs> sure, Mike. Ten tons of bitey teeth and catchy claws and actual flamethrowers is your friend. Yeah. Some monsters are nice. Although you can totally judge a book by its cover, spoiler alert, the best ones are the ones with robots and explosions, you shouldn't judge a video game character by the way they look. As proof, please accept these video game monsters who are actually lovely to be around and barely ever try to tear your arms off. Next time, put up a fight! Fawkes is pretty much the dictionary definition of a monster, being an eight foot tall green Frankenstein with anger management issues. But spend some time with him and you'll find he's a thoughtful and intelligent eight foot tall green Frankenstein. Win again! With, yes, some anger issues. But still, Fawkes always has our back, and for that we're grateful, because in the wasteland, everyone needs a friend who has a gigantic Gatling laser. What the shit is that? Let's take a closer look. Well, hi ho Name's Christopher. Christopher from Shadows of the Damned looks, how can I put this politely, absolutely f***ing terrifying. Well, shucks, you gotta look underneath the leathery exterior. But underneath that demonic exterior, Christopher is just a down-home good old boy who wants to help you out on your quest to kill the demon Lord Fleming. In fact, he's so enthusiastic that it's impossible not to get caught up in it yourself. Meaning you are on a quest to kick the Prince of Evil's ass? Holy shit! <laughs> oh, I want in on some of this action. How can I help, huh? How can I? Yeah, you're the best, Christopher. Oh, also he sells booze. Christopher is the best. Long delayed PlayStation game The Last Guardian is centered around the relationship between a young boy and his giant monster friend. But Trico is the least intimidating monster ever, having, as he does, the face and inquisitive nature of an adorable puppy. Seriously, look at this guy, the only thing he's endangering is the world's supply of tummy rubs. And I'm sure the game's Japanese title, Hitakuri no Owashi Toriko, which literally translates as Trico the large man-eating eagle, is nothing to be alarmed about. Who are you? I help any time. Given that absolutely everything in Dark Souls 3 is out to disembowel you, you can understand that we were cautious approaching the giant of the undead settlement, lest we get kicked off his tower like a tiny metal missile. Turns out the giant just wants to be friends, and if you make peace with him, he'll launch supersized arrows at your enemies from the safety of his lofty perch. So thanks, giant of the undead settlement, we're slowly learning to trust again. Ah, death to all monsters! Chewie, we got company. <laughs> Alright, don't try and tell me Chewbacca isn't a monster. He's seven foot tall, covered in hair, and will tear your arms off if you beat him at claymation space chess. That ticks so many of our monster boxes. Fortunately, in Star Wars games he's usually on our side, wrecking things up with his Wookiee bowcaster, bleating unintelligibly, and trying to make sure the Millennium Falcon doesn't fall out of the sky. I said trying, that one's totally on me. So yes, we're mostly happy to have Chewbacca on board as part of the Rebellion, though that said, can you imagine the state of the plug hole in the Falcon's shower? Gross. Now it's time to see what's written in the comments and in the safety instructions for evacuating the outside Xbox studio. In case of emergency evacuation, throw Mike through the window, creating an emergency exit, then jump through the window, landing safely on Mike. Did you write this? <laughs> that could be anyone's handwriting and signature. First up this week, your comments on last week's show about Telltale's Batman and the ways it lets you turn Bruce Wayne into a terrible dick. Only a vigilante crime fighter this filled with righteous anger by night could be this much of a jerk by day as secret identity billionaire playboy Bruce Wayne. Oh, and now I think about it, there's also how he's the only man in Gotham rich enough to afford all the bat toys, how his voice sounds basically the same, just pitch shifted up, and how he's totally ripped, presumably from thumping all those criminals. Comment crafter James Phelan is confused, asking, isn't being a dick Robin's job? Yes, when it's not being a Jason, or a Damien, okay, or a... we get it, you read comics. Tim. Mm-hmm, are you done? Stephanie. 
Commenter Kanemis, meanwhile, has more serious concerns with Telltale's depiction of Batman characters, saying, I just wonder why is Harvey Dent so huge in this game? He looks like Superman next to Bruce Wayne. I know you prefer the brooding billionaire angle, so the sooner we make nice with the donors, the sooner everyone will leave you alone. Holy sh you're right. He's the size of two Bruce Waynes. They'll have to call him Fourface. And commenter PancakeDog1313 writes to question our criticism of Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City, saying, At least Operation Raccoon City was better than Resident Evil 6. Resident Evil what? What Evil 6? Why do they keep doing this? They must want us to suffer, it's the only explanation. Moving on, here are your comments on this video about the bad guys who had a good point according to other commenters. We recently realised that sometimes the bad guy has a good point. But from the YouTube comments, it looks like we're not the only ones who recognise villains can do all the wrong things for some of the right reasons. It turns out you folks have plenty of candidates for the list of maybe not quite so bad guys. This is still a rich theme for comments as evidenced by all the comments from you folks, such as this one from Geozev, who says, M. Bison wanted to take over the world because he wanted to save it. He wanted to stop pollution and other things in his own unique way. Bison! <laughs> Your presence annoys me, worm. He seems nice. Gotta stop that pollution somehow. Commenter Oli Amin, meanwhile, thinks that Jonathan Irons from Advanced Warfare just wants to end all wars with world domination. And the DNA-specific race bomb, remember? Yeah, probably edges them onto the naughty list. And commenter Michael Elliott has a weird theory about Quantum Break, saying, Wait, that Paul Serene looks a lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Jack Joyce, in the flesh. The esteemed Mr. Paul Serene. I'm shaking money bags. Shut up and bring it in. <laughs> That's his accent, all right. Time manipulation now. Is there any length to which Littlefinger won't go to sit the Iron Throne? Oh, hey, also recently we killed Gary Busey in Hitman. Uh-oh. Wow. <laughs> Hi. 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 <laughs> Oh. Gary Busey is bulletproof. Yeah. <laughs> He's a bulletproof robot. Cole O'Donnell was particularly impressed by your performance, Jane, saying, Jane's plan to give Gary Busey a heart attack by shooting around him seems like the most creative kill ever. Right. Thank you. I'm glad someone got what I was going for. Meanwhile, commenter Shamrock Boy 21 offers this Gary explanation. Gary. The cry resounds as hordes of evil clones flood out of a vault. <laughs> Gary. Oh, so Gary Busey is one of those insane Gary clones from Fallout's Vault 108. That explains so much. Why are they meeting? What's their beef? He's screaming. He's screaming. Now, if I wasn't a badass bodyguard, I'd need you. <laughs> Seriously. Who's screaming? <laughs> Why, is this? Why is there screaming Why? happening? Finally, hard to pronounce commenter Zolotl Nefithis thinks that Andy's IMDb searching skills are on point. He was a regular chef on a cigarette break who will maybe use a cigarette break to kill the star of Slapshot 2 colon breaking the ice. Now, if you were the star of one episode of Shasta McNasty, where would you be? Uh, I'm pretty sure Andy came up with those off the top of his head. I mean, you could forget such classics as Bikini Model Academy and Ginger Dead Man. I saw you doing an IMDb search during that last clip. Actually, I was buying you a surprise birthday present, which is no longer a surprise, so present cancelled. That's on the lock screen. You're on the lock screen. Also, my birthday's in January. Your birthday's in January. That's what I just said. That's what you just said. OK, I'm going back to the studio. I'll see you later. See you later. That's it for this week's show, but under the terms of our new agreement with YouTube, the amount of oxygen in the studio is actually regulated by the number of likes we get. So if you could, <laughs> if you could see your way clear to just pressing the like button, we'd <coughs> really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. See you next <gasps> time. All right, lunch? Oh, uh, we can't, can we? We've got a fire drill. Oh, yeah. Try and roll as you land this time. <laughs>